Amen. Come on, say amen again like you mean it. <laughs> I am one of those talk back kind of preachers, so get ready to be high-fiving and fist pumping your neighbor. Amen. Uh, I haven't always been uh, Wesleyan. I, I guess I'm kind of Wesley Costal. Uh, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. It's great to have been a part of uh, yesterday and to see so many people gathered and the conversation. Thank you to Pastor Neftali, to Pastor Nathan and the uh, team here at Southview. We're, we're glad to be uh, back in the house today. Let me start with a story. I was out traveling much like I am today and um, I was in an area that I wasn't very used to. I flew in really late uh, on a Saturday night to minister on a Sunday morning and um, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, hungry. I was hungry with an O. And uh, you know how it is when you get hungry and you almost at hangry, you know what I'm saying? I was, I was hungry with an O. And I was looking around, I was in my rental car, I was looking around trying to find something. Is there anything open so I can grab me some, something to eat before I, I head to bed? Everything was closed, y'all. Everything was closed. And then all of a sudden, I see a Popeye's chicken light. <laughs> Popeye's is open. So I wheel that rental car into the drive through and I say, ma'am, can you give me a two-piece? Can you give me some of that dirty rice and some green beans? And she stops me mid-sentence, and she says, sir, 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 I am so sorry. We out of chicken. No. <laughs> no. I said, oh, ma'am, it sounded like you said. <laughs> Y'all out of chicken. She says, sir, I am so sorry. We just had two buses of football players. We are completely out of chicken. And I'm thinking what you think. You Popeyes. How in the world does Popeyes run out of chicken? I mean, it was not one of my finer spiritual moments. I mean, I sped off out of that drive through I was so tempted to call the corporate office and report that Popeyes. But here's the thing. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can be like that Popeyes. The thing that we should be known best for, we seem to be missing. Like, you expect Popeyes to have chicken. Amen? You would expect the church to be about reconciliation. You, you would expect the church to be about reaching, loving, discipling, and sending all, all people. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can fall into that Popeye's with no chicken mentality. Our culture is full of disparities. It is full of gaps in people groups. I mean, you got conservative and liberal. You got saved and unsaved. You got documented and not undocumented. You got educated and uneducated. You got young and old, wealthy and poor, black and white, uh, those who cheer for the cults and those who cheer for the lions. Come on, say amen, somebody. I mean, it's everything, right? But seriously, I think as followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility to bring people together. Remember yesterday I talked about, if you ever get sidetracked on this, this is really about reconciling people to God, and it's about reconciling people to people. That's really what this is all about, but sometimes we run into problems and we find ourselves struggling with this conversation, but a few things remain true, and that is we have one problem, sin, we have one solution, Jesus, we have one hope, Jesus' resurrection and second coming. We have one mission, and that's making and multiplying disciples. And we have one vehicle, my brothers and sisters, and that is love. And so I want to talk to you for a, a little while from this idea of moving from strangers to family. But let me tell you another story that helps us get, get the ball rolling. I was at this conference. It was a manpower conference in, I think, 99. 1999. It was done by uh, T.D. Jakes. It was in the Washington, D.C. area. And I took a group of students with me to this conference. And we were at the end of the conference. And the last speaker was one of the guys that I, I knew, F Bishop Claude Alexander. He's from the Charlotte area. I'm a, a North Carolina native. And I was so excited and anticipating his message. It was, it was a powerful word. But there was this guy. There was this guy who was sitting behind me who was just loud. 
I mean, he wasn't saying anything bad. I mean, he wasn't being negative, but he just kept saying stuff like, preach it, brother. Tell it like it is, brother. You on fire, brother. Now, I come from a call and response environment. You can probably tell. But like when you have somebody in your ear behind you like that for 45 minutes, it's a little distracting. And, and so he gets to the end of the message and he's like, I want you to turn to somebody close to you and I want you to pray. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm turning to my right, I'm turning to my left, I'm reaching for people in front of me. I'm like, I am not looking behind me. And, and everybody had already found somebody, and I was like, come on, God, are you serious? And so I turn around, and their brother was like, looks like it's me and you. <laughs> oh, God. So I turn around, I grab hands with this brother. He starts praying. I'm not really praying. I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, when is this going to be over? He says, amen. I say, amen. I'm like, shh, thank God that's done. And have you ever had a moment where you felt like conviction? Like, I, I turn back around, and I'm like, shouldn't have treated my brother in Christ like that. So he starts tapping me on the shoulder. He's like, hey, 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 I feel like the Lord wants us to pray again. <sighs> so I feel conviction. I was like, okay, I'm going to really pray this time. I turn around. I grab hands with this brother. He starts praying. I start praying. And, and have you ever had a moment where you felt like the spirit and presence of God filled the room? Where it felt like time stood still? Where you felt the power and the presence of God. And I, I won't tell you the whole story, but God moved in a powerful way. I'm, I'm, I'm in tears. I'm sobbing. Uh, God is speaking and he's moving. I, I, I turn back around after we pray. I sit down and, and there's this moment where I, I, I sense, man, I was this close to missing something God wanted to do because of who he wanted to do it through. And here's the interesting thing. The story doesn't end there. He's taps me on the shoulder again, this time not so strongly. And he says, hey, I feel like we're supposed to stay in contact with each other. So I pull out my business card. He pulls out his business card. And I turn around and I look at it. Come to find out, me and this brother have the same last name. <laughs> True story. I start talking to him and I find out we are distant cousins who have never met before. <laughs> True story. But it's an indication of how God in his divine timing and in his divine will will move us from strangers to family. I think as believers, we are leaders who are called to be bridge builders, who are sent to close what's called the gospel gap. So what does God, the master builder of our lives and his son, the chief cornerstone of the church, have to say to us in this community in this season? We, we have to remember that there's always an upper story and a lower story going on in Scripture. The upper story is what God is doing for his people, what we would call the big C church. And then there's the lower story of what he's doing in us individually and the local expression of what we call the little C church. And we have to pay attention to both. Somebody shout both. So as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, we're going to see some things that I think are really important as we have this conversation about being a healthy, multi-ethnic church and being a part of a healthy, multi-ethnic movement. Now, I'll be reading from the NIV. Verse 11, Ephesians 2 says this, therefore, somebody shout therefore. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and call uncircumcised by, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Verse 2, verse 12 says, remember, somebody shout remember, remember. that at that time you were separate from Christ, hmm, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners. You see that word? Foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Hmm. But now, somebody shout, but now. <laughs> in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. From strangers to family. Let's pray. Father, we know the flower fades, the grass withers, but your word stands forever. Speak into this moment. 
Uh, move me at the background. May you be at the forefront. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Speak now. Give us all the courage to respond in obedience. We pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. From strangers, strangers, strangers to family. The book of Ephesians uh, is a book written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, and it's broken up into basically two parts. The first half of the book, the first three chapters, are written to help us understand who we are in Christ. Somebody shout in, in Christ. It's about our identity in chapters one through three, and then the last half is about giving us practical tools of how to live based on what we know or who we know we are in Christ. Christ. So first three, who we are. The last, what do I do? And so in this passage, Paul reminds us that we are basically two groups of people. They're Jews and they're Gentiles. The Jews were told in the law of Moses to not have any dealings with Gentiles, and Gentiles were outsiders, and Jews were insiders. The bad news, most, if not all of us, would have been considered and are considered Gentile. Why? Because there is no connection to any Hebrew or Jewish roots. And Jesus was clear in John chapter 4, verse 22, when he spoke to the Samaritan woman by the well by saying, salvation is of the Jews. So Gentiles had no covenant. He says in this text, they had no promise of divine protection. They were all far from God and they were without or we were without hope. That's the really bad news. Amen. But now, <laughs> do you see that how it turns on the, on the dime? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near through what? The blood of Christ. High five your neighbor, fist bump him or something to say, but now. But now, but now, but now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, hell would have had a party had it not been for verse 13. But now, I, I remember uh, the old folks at my church used to say, I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood save me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross, and I know it was the blood save me. See, there's something special about the blood of Jesus. <laughs> the power of Jesus is resurrection. Some of you graduated magna cum laude. Some of you summa cum laude. But others in here have just graduated. Thank you, Lordy. <laughs> Thank you for saving me from my mess. Thank you for bringing me out of that storm. Thank you for what you've done. But now. Ah. I love the way Tim Keller says it. He says, Jesus sees me as is, accepts me as is, loves me as is, saves me as is, yet by his grace never leaves me as is. Oh, that's good. That's good. And so the first point I want to talk to you about is our position, our position in Christ. Somebody shout position. Uh, whenever I lived in Indiana. We lived here for two years when we when I first started working for the Wesleyan Church. My wife and I, and my, at the time we had two kids, uh, we had three kids. My fourth child uh, was born here, uh, and, and, and I remember uh, someone inviting me to my first Colts game. <laughs> I grew up in North Carolina. I'm, I'm a Saints fan because I didn't have a, a team in our state growing up, and eventually I became a Carolina Panthers a fan because they came on later as a as a teenager and, and as I'm in college, and, uh, but, but I, I, was, I was wanting to cheer for the home team, you know? And so I went and got me some Colts stuff, you know what I mean? I got me a Colts jacket, a Colts hat, and, and this guy was like, okay, uh, I, I'm gonna pick you up and I'm gonna take you to the game. And so we, we, we go past like the normal parking where m most people park, and I'm like, we're not gonna park over there? No, no, we got, a, we got a special place we're gonna park. And so he takes me behind the building. We park behind the building. I'm like, what is this? I didn't even know there was parking back here. And, and then he, he, he gets out of the car. Somebody's opened the door. And we start walking through this, this space. And I'm thinking, like, where, wh where do we get our tickets? He was like, we don't, 
we don't need tickets. We got badges. And he, he gives me a badge. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is different. This, this, this is different. And then we get in and, and we sit in what is called box seats. And when you have box seats and you have a suite, you sit where you can see the game, but then you can move from your seat and you can go into a suite to get food. <laughs> oh, it was nice, <laughs> Pastor. Oh, it was nice. And so I would go in to get food, and they had this nice, like, layout, catered meal, and uh, people are waiting on your hand and foot, like, what else do you need, sir? Can I bring you something? I'm like, what is going on? And, and what, I, what I want you to understand is when we got to the entry point of, of, of that door, the people looked at him before they looked at me, and they didn't even pay attention to my badge. They basically let me in because of who I came with. <laughs> is anybody getting this? See, see what you got to understand about your position in Christ, it is never about anything you've done. It's always about what he's done and what he's given you access to are things that you would never have access to on your own. It is because of our position in Christ that we, we are seen different through the lens of the Father because of our position. Y'all are, are hearing what I'm saying. And so here in verse 13, Paul tells us about our position in Christ. If you're going to move from strangers to family and pursue reconciliation, you'll need to know the power and purpose of your position in. Somebody shout in. In. In Christ. It's tempting in our Western world to just celebrate the condition of the believer. The condition. Like what you have and how you feel and what you're going through. It's not that those things aren't important, but Paul seems to celebrate our position in Christ. This, this is not about happiness. This is about holiness. This is not about temporal things. This is about eternal things. This, this is not about frivolous surface stuff, but this is about what really matters. Your condition might change, but let's start celebrating what the enemy can't shake. <laughs> let's start celebrating what the enemy can't touch, your position in Christ. <laughs> it's so, so important. And what you do from that position is critical, but it keeps on going. Watch what it says in verse 14. It says, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one. Somebody shout one. The two groups one, he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commands and regulations. Watch this. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. What? His purpose was to create in. You notice that? Somebody shout in. In himself, the body one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through what? The cross. the cross. By which he did what? He put to death their hostility. Here we see that Jesus' intent was always to make the two groups one, two enemies one, two strangers one. But he does so by destroying the dividing wall of hostility. And as followers of Jesus, we have to understand that there will always be things out there trying to distract us, trying to detour us, trying to destroy us. And if we walk with God long enough, there will always be opposition. The enemy will work to erect walls of hostility, walls that you sometimes have to climb over, walls that sometimes you have to go around, and walls that sometimes you have to dig under. But I want to say sometimes there are walls that you got to, kick down in the name of Jesus <laughs> while we're doing this weekend. And so the second point that I want to talk to you about is this idea, not just your position, but I want to talk to you about your opposition. Is that all right? So there's a position in Christ, but you will always have opposition. Uh, let me give an example. So um, I was um, um, with a friend of mine in Michigan when we ministered. We lived there for about four years. I was serving as a high school pastor there. And I just finished doing something, and uh, one of the guys there, he was a youth pastor about an hour south of us, and he says, I, I need you to come and speak at my youth retreat. And I was like, okay, I got you, no problem. You know, just let me know, details, whatever. And so I marked my calendar, I prepared to go speak. And uh, then he calls me, um, and he's like, you know, 
I forgot to tell you that the retreat is actually a hoedown. I said, a ho what? You know, I'm brother from North Carolina, from the hood, ain't never been to a hoedown, not even sure what a hoedown is. And so I start trying to Google it, spell it, I didn't even spell it right the first time. I didn't, had no idea, I was like, oh, 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 that's a hoedown. Like, I'm, I'm, are you sure? You got the right person? He was like, oh man, you'll be great, you'll be great, just come. And so I'm like, oh man, like, and so I usually take students, you know, that are feel called to ministry with me, and so we're all driving down to this, to this retreat, and it's, it's snowing. I mean, I'm from North Carolina, and when they call for snow, everything shuts down. And so I call them, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm so sad that this is not going to happen because of the snow, and I'm prepared to turn around. And he's like, oh, no, no, we own, because we in Michigan. <laughs> they, they do stuff in snow. And so we get down, and, and I was like, we're about to get out of the car, and I looked at my students that I have with me, and I'm like, y'all ever been to a hoedown before? They was like, nope. And I was like, we can all check this off the bucket list. You know what I'm saying? Because we, we at one. We at one. And so we, we get to the door, and I start hearing the music. <laughs> oh, it's country music. And I, and I walk in, and I got my students with me, and I'm looking. and I, I mean, people got on the cowboy hats. I mean, they got on the, the bandanas. They got on the big belt buckles and the cowboy boots. And they're out there, yee And I'm like, what have I got myself into? And I start looking around the room. I'm scanning the room. I'm, I'm trying to find somebody that looks like me. I mean, I'm looking around. I'm, mm, mm, and there was one of us. There was one. And I actually brought the other one with me. I mean, there were two, actually. <laughs> but before long, I mean, they got me out there. I'm do si doing I'm yee-hawing. I'm doing the whole thing. And... I preached this simple message about God's grace, and 12 students give their life to Christ that night. 12 students, we celebrate that, amen? Now, why do I tell you that story? Because if I could be honest, there was a part of me that didn't want to be there. There was a part of me that just wasn't sure I was the right person, and that was the right moment. There was a part of me that just wasn't sure that anything I had to offer would connect with a group like that. And what I want to say to you is sometimes the opposition is not always outside of you. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. Sometimes the opposition is what's going on inside of you. And in that moment, like, I was so caught up in my own stuff and and, and my own bias and my own idea of, of what this group was capable of seeing and understanding, it, it was a changing and transformative moment for me because I realized that God can still use us even though there might be junk going on inside of us. Let me say that again. God can still use us even though there might be junk going on inside of us. Part of the process of moving from strangers to family is it's not just what God does in the hearts of others, it's sometimes what God has to do in our hearts. Now, I, at that point in my life, I have been pastoring for about 12 years. 12 years! <laughs> but I was so used to being in certain contexts and being among certain individuals that I found myself caught up in a moment, and it was when God really shifted in me you, I can use you in any environment if you just yield to my will. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, the opposition is in us. Father, if there were no devil, if there were no enemy, save me from me. Save me from the enemy that is sometimes inside of me. Deliver me from the traps that the enemy sets around me. This passage in Ephesians seems to suggest that Christ died to tear down walls. As followers of Jesus, we must refuse to be a place that erects walls that Jesus came to abolish. As followers of Jesus, we do not reject who Jesus died to save. As followers of Jesus, we seek to tear down walls instead of building them. Today, the walls are not just in Jewish temple courtyards, uh, but 
but they are real uh, racial walls, they are gender walls, they are generational walls, they are orientation and gender identity walls, they are socioeconomic walls, they are denominational walls, and dare I say that they are sometimes political walls. It must be frustrating sometimes to be God and watch us preach about love in segregated churches when he died to break down the walls of hostility. It must be frustrating sometimes to be God and watch us ask for what he's already given us the ability to do to walk into his racially reconciled finished work. So what is our biblical definition of reconciliation? Brenda Salter McNeil uh, in her book Roadmap to Reconciliation she says it this way. Reconciliation is an ongoing process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that restores broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. Um, I was in Ghana, West Africa. I've been cutting my hair since I was in middle school, but I was in Ghana, West Africa, and for the first time, and uh, it was the first time that I'd ever really been, I mean, really, like, abroad. And um, I, had, I didn't know that, like, sometimes the voltage is different when you're in different places. And so I took my clippers, and I was preparing to cut my hair, and I plug in my clippers, and I turn them on, and they start smoking. <laughs> Not good. Not good. Not good. And so my clippers are fried. I can't use them. And so my hair is just growing, and I, I, used to, I usually cut my hair a couple times a week. And so my hair is growing out. I look like the Willie Mammoth. And, um, and, and finally, I, the guy that's touring us around, he gets a haircut. And I say, I'm like, hey, 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 Kofi, who did your hair? Like, who cut your hair? And he's like, man, like, there's a guy in Kumasi where I live. We're going there this week, and, and, and I'll see if he can cut your hair. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm finally going to get it. So we get to Kofi's house. The guy's going to come and cut, our, cut my hair there. He shows up. I'm so excited. We, we talk for a bit. And uh, he's like, well, you know, I need to take you outside into the courtyard. And so we go outside into the courtyard, and, like, there are all these people in the courtyard. And I'm like, what are the people? And so I was like, hey. Oh. And um, th there's this chair in the courtyard. I mean, it's just sitting there. I mean, it's just like this. There's a chair in the middle of the courtyard, and there's a bucket of water sitting by the chair. And I'm walking out, and I'm like, Lord, please help me to survive whatever's about to happen in <laughs> Jesus' name. So, you know, I don't try not to look afraid or bewildered, and I'm like shook. And I sit down in the chair, and he puts his hand in the water and starts massaging my scalp. I'm like, oh, Lord, water and clippers don't mix. So he pulls out his little bag, and it's not any clippers connected to Electricity, he pulls out his bag. The first thing he pulls out doesn't alarm me. I mean, it's just a comb. But the second thing, he pulls out a razor blade. And he takes these two things, a small comb and a razor blade. And, and I'm sitting there like, Lord, please don't let a fly fly on my nose or my ear. <laughs> And he cuts my hair in like 15 minutes. And you know, um, you know how it is. The last thing you do when you get a haircut is you get the line. You know what I'm saying? You got to get the line and the parts and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm tempted to tell him, don't do the line. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's a little more intense, right? Because you got to like, but he gets, he starts working on the line. And I'm praying in Jesus' name, help me there be no blood or anything. And so he finishes and he hands me the mirror. And I kick the mirror like, hey, 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 hey. People start clapping, they're like, ooh, oh, yes, yes. And so I hug the brother, you know, I'm partially hugging him because I survived, and I'm thankful. And so people disperse, uh, we go back in the house, and um, we start talking, and I'm like, man, how long have you been cutting hair? I'm hearing more of his story. And, uh, and I was like, man, like, when you first pull out the, the razor blade and the, all that stuff, like, it, you, know, you know, I almost passed out, but I survived, you know. And he's like, well, I'm glad I didn't pull this out. And he pulls out this Rambo-looking, like, knife. I'm like, I'm so, like, I would have been out if you pulled that out. <laughs> and then I ask the question you're probably wondering, where were all these people then here? And Kofi said, I forgot to tell you, like, this brother's business, um, his business collapsed due to fire. Um, and then 
Ghana, you can't just start up a new business when you're building. Um, it's totally wrong. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. And he said he's been trying to rebuild his business. And I knew that if people saw you as an American leader allowing him to cut your hair in public, then his business would skyrocket and he would get back on his feet. And I looked over at the brother while Koki was telling me this story and tears were streaming down his face. And he said, I was struggling to provide for my family and now it won't be a struggle anymore. I'm gonna have to get more barbers. I'm gonna have to get more people. I'm gonna have to find another location because we were willing to do this. Do you know that even though God includes you, most of what he does in you and through you is not really about you? Let me say that again. Even though God does choose to include you, most of what he does in you and through you is really not about you. That was one of those lessons for me. It was something God was up to. I had no idea about, but he was accomplishing it in that moment without my permission. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Some things he's just going to do without your permission. And then there's some things he's going to include you in that you're, you're well aware of what he's up to, and, and God's going to use you that way. Watch what it says in verse 19. I slide down to 19. It says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone in him. Somebody shout in him. The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Uh, and in him, somebody shout in him. You too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So my last point to you, uh, it's not just about our position. It's not just about our opposition, but it's also about our unity. We talked a little bit yesterday about John 17. This good news brings people together. We are no longer to be separated. This, this says we are we are the temple. We are the church. In the ancient world, the church soon became one of the only places where meaningful relationships were built and sustained crossing these kinds of lines. Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, male and female, they became one. There is no black Holy Spirit and white Holy Spirit. There is not a Hispanic Holy Spirit and a Burmese Holy Spirit. There is one. There is not one spirit for women and another one for men. There's not one for adults and another one for kids. There is one spirit and we are one family. Somebody shout one. Now, yes, we, we are different and those differences should be celebrated, but they should never take precedent over our oneness. We are to be joined together. The Bible says that we are being built together for a purpose, and God wants his people to be his ambassadors intentionally, uh, culturally, uh, building bridges because we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Now, if the truth be told, we have to extend a lot of grace during these kinds of conversations and this kind of work. And if we're honest, it has become a credibility issue for us uh, as we're looking uh, uh, people are looking from outside, inside the church. And many people have become cynical and they see our hypocrisy and our lack of action. And some people, if I'm honest, as I tour, tour around the country and sometimes around the world having this conversation, some people spend more energy resisting being called a racist than they actually do fighting racism. Let me say that again. Many people spend more energy resisting being called racist than they do actually fighting racism. So how do we do this work? What are some of the personal obstacles? And then I'll give you some solutions. Here are some potential ob obstacles, awkwardness. When I just said the word racism, some of you started spraying. It's just like, okay, how is he gonna approach this? If you were here yesterday, you'd know that I approach it from three foundational scriptures, the great commission, the great commandment, and the great collaboration. These are all words spoken by Jesus uh, about us uh, not only pursuing this, but this is biblical. The foundation of reconciliation is found in scripture. Jesus articulates it, right? This idea of us going and making disciples, uh, us loving and us doing it together. 
we see that in multiple passages. But it's, but it's awkward. It's awkward, right? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Where do you begin? What do I do if I disagree with people? I don't want to be called racist. I'm tired of always feeling like I got to defend myself or explain my experience. Like, it's awkward. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but guess what? Jesus often allowed himself and his disciples to be put in awkward positions. The woman at the well. Awkward. The woman that washed his feet with her tears. Awkward. The Syrophoenician woman eating bread from the table like dogs. Awkward. It will be awkward. The second thing is the danger of a single story. Like no group of people is monolithic. We have different views and experiences, but we must be willing to learn from each other. Uh, third thing is you have a 100% chance, not, not 80, not 90, 100%. You got a 100% chance that you will eventually offend or be offended. 100%. 100% chance that you'll eventually say something offensive. And sometimes our fear is we don't want to offend. That's partially good because we don't want to hurt people, but sometimes that fear keeps us from acting. That fear keeps us from uh, building bridges. That fear prevents us from stepping into uncomfortable situations. But trust me, you will have a 100% chance. I've been doing this for almost 30 years and I still put my foot in my mouth sometimes. Can I get an amen? I told you yesterday, I'm no expert. I'm just an expert on my experience, but I'm no expert at this. Next thing, it will bring up shame and or pain. We have to name those things and be honest if we're going to heal from them. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit, but shame is not from God. Uh, Brene Brown helps us in understanding that guilt is a feeling we have when we do something bad, but shame is when we think we are something bad. Some of us we need to forgive while others will need to begin seeing ourselves and others through a lens of the Imago Dei. Um, now that leads to some practical things. Um, the first thing is you gotta have a multi-ethnic life. Kathy Litton, we're not sure if Kathy, Kathy Litton said this first or Derwin Gray, but both of them have this statement that I think is very true. And they say that um, your church will not truly become multi-ethnic on Sunday until your Monday through Saturday is multi-ethnic. I'm gonna say that again. Your church will not truly become multi-ethnic on Sunday until you lead a multi-ethnic life Monday through Saturday. Expecting it to just happen because we love Jesus, guess what? It's not just gonna happen. You have to start living a multi-ethnic life. You have to have multi-ethnic relationships. You are who you attract. Amen? And generally what happens is we invite people to church who look like us, who think like us, who vote like us. But what happens when you lead a multi-ethnic life is you start building relationships cross-culturally. You start building relationships with people who don't eat like you, think like you, vote like you. And now you're leading a multi-ethnic life and now your church starts to reflect your life. Come on, say amen. Come on, say amen. Kind of quiet a multi-ethnic life and we can we can talk through and, and you'll, you'll be continuing to talk through how to do that and then you have to see distance and you have to see distance as a barrier to peace uh, there's a quote an African proverb that says from a distance I saw a monster when I became closer I thought it was human when I was face to face I realized it was my brother distance demonizes but comprehension increases with more healthy conversation but like we have to reserve the right to judge until you're close enough to understand. Next point, we have to learn to listen to learn. Often when we're listening, we're listening to fix. Often when we're listening, we're listening to defend. Often when we're listening, we're listening to hijack. But what we have to do is we have to shift our posture to a listening to learn. Like when you get into a situation where someone says something or their lifestyle causes you to get into a huff, Come on, say amen. Like what they say on social media or what they say at the dinner table causes you to get into a huff. Stop, slow down, and listen to learn. Don't listen to defend, don't listen to fix, don't listen to hijack, listen to learn. And then the last thing in this space is understand that our compassion, watch this, our compassion must not be contingent on shared conviction. Say that again, because that's good. 
our compassion must not be contingent on shared conviction. Reconciliation and being multi-ethnic helped the early church in the book of Acts, specifically in Antioch, to be more, a more credible witness of the wall-destroying gospel that we are proclaiming now. You may ask, is there room? Is there room for ethnic and language-specific ministries as we're talking about moving from strangers to family? And my answer to that is absolutely. There is always room for islands of particularity in an ocean of unity. However, we never want to separate people out permanently. Our goal is to develop relationships and ministry opportunities that bridge people into a unified work where we can all become one. What is called the HUP or the homogeneous unit principle was never meant to be a strategy to build churches. It was meant to be a strategy of evangelism. And so you have to remember that Jesus started both with an ethnic and a gender specific discipleship model. You remember? But it evolved. He started with Hebrew boys, Israelite boys, Jewish boys, but it eventually evolved. It evolved from the 12 to the 72, from the 72 to the 144. He shifts people's thinking when he talks to the Samaritan woman at the well. He shifts people's thinking when he administers to the Syrophoenician woman about the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And how could we forget how he elevates the importance of children? By the time Jesus ascends into heaven, he leaves behind disciples who are both men and women, clergy and lay, young and old, poor and healthy and wealthy Jew and Gentile he modeled how we are to make and model uh, and multiply disciples by crossing cultural barriers yes God has called you at this church at Southview to be disruptive you have already played a huge role in this district and in this city and we are proud of what you're doing the challenge though is disruptors can eventually become settlers you remember Blockbuster. Come on, say amen. I found my Blockbuster card recently. <laughs> Y'all remember Friday and Saturday nights going to get some VHS tapes? <laughs> Come on. You remember Blackberry phones? You remember Borders? At some point, these pioneers became settlers and they were no longer disruptors. Redbox emerged. Amazon emerged, iPhones emerged because they could see and wanted to walk into a bright future that was beyond them. The future, our ancestors whose shoulders we stand on, the future they once saw we are now living into. But I want to challenge you at Southview Church and as a part of this community, don't stop seeing. Don't get settled in. Don't become a blockbuster, a borders, or a blackberry. Hear my parting words and then I'll give you a story and I'm done. People are not interested in being our projects. So as you shift into this multi-ethnic mindset, I want you to remember people are not interested in being our projects. I remember I was in a community where people would send mission teams to serve, and sometimes groups did not realize that they had that, that wall on the other side of our church had been painted eight times over the summer because we were struggling to figure out what to give them to do because we knew that we were thankful that they came in, but like when you see people as projects, you, you, you don't see how the work is really supposed to be done. So we had to give them a task because the real work requires relational trust. Come on, say amen. It requires relational trust and you don't get that overnight. You definitely don't get that in a week. Now people are definitely gonna be thankful for what you might do, but like to really build relationships that cause transformation, it takes Time. People are not interested in being our projects. Second thing in here is, is living in the tension with people instead of trying to solve their problems is where trust and unity is built. And then for this community, racial reconciliation is not just a leadership issue or a social issue or even a diversity issue. We have to see it as an issue of discipleship. Um, so my last story and I'm done. Um, so <coughs> I was ministering in Michigan and one of the pastors, we had just arrived and one of the pastors invited me and my wife and my kids to go boating out on this place called Sli uh, Green Lake. And I'm not really a boater. Come on, say amen. Um, but I said yes, 
and I got into the boat, and it was beautiful. The lake was beautiful. The boat was amazing. And eventually, Pastor Mike throws behind the boat some tubes, and my kids, who have never been tubing before, they, they get into this boat. My wife is really nervous because she can't swim. And, um, and so she's a little nervous. I'm excited. I'm watching them have a great time. And I'm like, hey, Pastor Mike, you got something big enough for me? You know what I'm saying? I want to, you know, get into a tube or whatever. And he blows up this thing called a mega bowl. Look just like that. And so I get into the mega bowl, y'all, and I'm tubing behind the boat, bouncing on the waves. I'm waving at people on the shore. Like, what's up, y'all? We all tubing around here. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting it in. And then my, Pastor Mike makes a turn. Why did he turn so fast? He didn't do that with the kids. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm flying in the air. Me and the mega bowl are flying in the air. I'm turning. My legs are flailing. I'm holding on for my dear life. And then I crash back into the water. And I'm like, Pastor Mike, stop playing. <laughs> he looks back at me. It's like he's got this vein bulging out his forehead. He does not look happy. And he gives that little red boat everything it, he's got. And I'm thinking to myself, please, Pastor Mike, whatever you do, don't turn. And Pastor Mike, turn. And I get to that point now, y'all, I know what's coming now. And I'm holding on and I'm flying through the air again. This time, it's so far, I'm so high, I can't hold on anymore. I let go, I'm flying through the air, my arms are flailing, legs are flailing. And that boat speeds off and I crash down into the water. And I start going down into the water. You know what I forgot to tell Pastor Mike? Was that I could uh, kind of swim. <laughs> and you know, when you kind of swim, you're used to swimming in pools. <laughs> and when you can kind of swim, you're used to just trying to get to the edge. You know what I'm saying? You know, just get to the edge. Just swim under the water. You know, try to do something above the water. Just get to the edge. And when you get to the edge, you safe. <laughs> but when you can kind of swim in a lake that is three miles long and five miles wide, the edge is a long way away. And so I'm going down into the water. The boat has sped off. I can see my wife standing up, looking. My kids are like, Daddy! Going down in the water, I'm taking in water. I'm thinking to myself, God, please don't let me die out here in front of my kids. And I'm going down in the water. I can see the water going over my head. I'm thinking, this is it. <laughs> and then I heard something say, be still. I forgot I had a life jacket on, y'all. <laughs> I started rising to the top. <laughs> I'm sitting on top of the water. And all I could say was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, that boat comes back, and I can hear Pastor Mike, you okay? And the back, blah, 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 Talk to you. Here's why I tell you that story. I think doing multi-ethnic work, having these kind of conversations, there are times where you feel like I did at the beginning. We all tubing around here. What's up, y'all? other times when you feel like you're dying in the water. It's overwhelming. It's painful. It looks like you're going to kill yourself. And you don't know what to say to the people who are watching what's happening. And in those moments, I want to remind you of what God spoke into me in that moment. Be still and know that he is God. Know that the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Yes, Sometimes you may do something foolish. Yes, sometimes you may make a mistake, but I want to remind you that he has got you. And as I was sitting on top of that water, I'll never forget. It, it has carried me now uh, some 10, some 14 years later. He says to me while I'm sitting on the water, waiting for them to come back. And so I want to remind you when you get to those points where you're you're not sure what to say. You're not really sure what to do. When you get to those points where people in this church or people in this community are frustrated and are not sure and they leave and they, they walk away, people that you've lived with for many years, people you've worshipped with for many years, people you've served with many years who, have who will turn away and walk away or they'll say, I'm no longer giving to this church because of this, uh, 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 this, this pursuit. I want to remind you that God 
you're not the first, you won't be the last, but as you move people from strangers to family, it creates conflict. Conflict internally, conflict externally, and the only way you're gonna be able to walk through it is to embrace the dependence that you and I must have on the Holy Spirit. It's got to be dependence on the Holy Spirit. It's got to be trust in God's word because there will always be reasons that people will give you of why they don't want to pursue a multi-ethnic church and a multi-ethnic life. And if you remind them that this is biblically focused, not politically focused, if you remind them that this is discipleship, not just some diversity initiative, then you help to pull them back to a place where hopefully they can see the hope of the gospel that comes through this. Reconciliation is a finished work done by Christ. We don't finish it. Christ has already finished it. We are simply to pursue reconciliation on earth because of what Christ has already done. Much like our salvation, we'll go through the process of called sanctification where we're made more and more like Christ. Reconciliation is like it in a similar way. Christ has done his part. We must do ours by walking through the process of reconciliation with each other. Let's move from strangers to family for the sake of the gospel. Amen.